Hello everyone, my name is Wofil and welcome to the third episode of Stress Explained – Magically Easy, a video series where I explain how and why different stress and glitches speedrunners use work. As always, we had a poll and you chose a topic about the in-game timer, so today we're gonna look at why it is broken in GTA 3 and Y City, what effects we see in-game, and of course, how we can fix it. First of all, let's see how it is related to speedrunning. There are tons of categories you can speedrun and most of you are probably familiar with any percent where your goal is to finish the game as fast as possible. But what some people don't know is that there is another block with its own categories called individual levels. The idea is very simple, you choose a mission and you try to complete it as fast as possible. The catch is that you're allowed to prepare any setups before you start the mission, as long as you don't use cheats of course. And that's what makes these categories great you're encouraged to think outside of the box. For example, in this clip I was pushing explosive barrels to the spots where the trucks from taking out the laundry were going to spawn. Then I put rigged cars near them so I could detonate them remotely. Now I just start the mission, skip the cutscene, spam the left mouse button to detonate everything and complete the mission in just 2 seconds. Here is another example. Using glitches I made a radio-controlled rhino and used it to complete the mission in one second. To find these categories you go on the main page of the game, click leaderboards, level leaderboard. And now we are here. And as you can see, apart from the storyline missions that are actually somewhere below, there are some side missions as well, including races. And as you probably know, races are very good because they have an in-game timer that allows you to track your records. This makes Moderator's life a lot easier because they don't have to download your run and retime it later. But if we actually look at the rules, at the very bottom we will see that the primary timing method for the leaderboard remains real time. This wasn't always like that, it has been changed like a year ago I think, due to several reasons, one of them being the aforementioned inaccuracy of the timer. Pay attention to these two clips. On the left side we have a save file with roughly 12 hours played, and on the right side we have a save file with almost 150 hours played. Initial states were exactly the same as you could see, but if you pay attention to the in-game clocks you will see that they are already desynced. And of course the longer you play, the bigger the difference becomes. And just in about 30 seconds of this clip we got a difference of almost one full second. It works this way, there is an internal timer, and it just goes up and up and up, and everything else, timers and missions, the in-game clock, etc, rely on this internal timer. And as you can see, if you play for way too long, the internal timer stops, the in-game clock stops, text doesn't disappear from the screen, race time is 0 seconds even though we are driving for quite a while already. And just like that I managed to finish the race in 0 seconds, which is a new world record according to the old rules at least. Sad that they changed them. Oh yeah, there is another side effect. If you get out of the vehicle, the camera is not going to follow the character. Luckily you can fix that by aiming with something like a rocket launcher, although I don't suggest you to shoot. There are many more glitches related to the broken timer and I'm going to show you some of them in the end of the video. Let's finally look at the code. Once again we are using RE3 class ctimer function update, which is the function that is used to update the in-game timer. I removed all of the irrelevant parts of the code and we are going to focus our attention on these two lines. Let's start with the second one, because here we have this variable called msntime in milliseconds, which is basically our internal timer that we are talking about. As you can see, the time is stored in milliseconds, which means that instead of one second you have 1000 milliseconds. What we also need to know is the type of the variable. We can see it here. It's uint32. What is uint32? How do we understand it? It's actually pretty simple. Int is short for integer, so whole numbers like 5, 15, minus 3, etc. U means unsigned, which is basically unsigned integer. Those are non-negative integers. 0, 5, 11, 132 etc. 32 is the length of the variable in bits, but we are going to talk about it later. Let's go back. So what happens when this function is called? First of all, we take the current value of the variable and we add something called frame time, 
Once again, simply judging by its name, we can already assume that it is the length of one frame in milliseconds. If we look here, we'll see the same variable. And what's important is its type. As you can see, it's different. It's float. Floats are used for real numbers like 1.5, minus 3.2, etc. Of course, you can store whole numbers in floats as well, but they're going to be treated like 2.0, for example. You see? Doesn't really matter. What we have here also doesn't really matter because all it does is it, as I've already said, calculates the length in milliseconds, which is basically something like 1000 milliseconds divided by 30 if you are playing in 30 FPS. And speedrunners are playing in 30 FPS because it's a rule, you have to have your frame limiter on. 1000 divided by 30 is roughly 33.33333 and this formula on the left calculates exactly the same number. It does it a bit differently, probably a bit more precisely, but yeah, all in all it's just 33.3. .3. Okay, so why is it important to understand that these variables have different types? Well, it turns out that the computer doesn't really know how to adapt an integer and a float, and that's why the language standard exists. Right here I have a good article that simply summarizes the key points for us. Of course I'll leave the link to it in the description. It's called implicit conversions. We need a very few points from here and the first one is at the very top. In the assignment operator, and we have it right here, the value of the right hand operand, which is whatever we get right here, is converted to the unqualified type of the left hand operand which is, as we already know, uint32. Okay, but what do we actually get right here? For that we need to scroll a bit further, arithmetic conversions, and we need number 3. Otherwise, if one operand is float, and we have float right here, it's frame time, the other operand is implicitly converted as follows, integer type to float. Aha, so now we finally understand what's going on. When the program executes this line, first of all, it converts our integer to a float, then it adds up two floats together, and then we get a float, obviously, and we convert it back to an integer. Hmm, sounds good, but where is the problem? To answer this question, we will have to look at how these types are stored in memory. Let's start with integers because they are easier to explain. The size of an integer is 4 bytes. Each byte contains 8 bits, so 4 times 8 is 32. That's the number of cells I should put on the screen. But that's way too many, it's not going to look good. Let's use 1 byte. It works exactly the same way, it's just smaller. Here are our 8 cells, in each of them you can put either 0 or 1, and you get a whole binary number. How do we convert it to the familiar decimal representation now? For that let's enumerate the cells, but in a specific way. First of all, we are going to do that from right to left, and second, we are going to start with 0. Now let's take the value from each cell and multiply it by 2 to the power of the index of the corresponding cell. Let's add some colors so it's obvious where everything comes from. Now we simply add everything together and calculate the result. As you can see, nothing complicated, trivial mess, any pretty can do it. Alright, but what about negative values? For that we sacrifice the highest bit and say that now it shows the sign, which means we simply put a minus here and there and we get our new result. If the sign bit is zero, then we don't get the negative at the end. According to all I've said, we can finally get the range of numbers you can store in one byte or how it is also called char. As I said before, integers are exactly the same, just bigger. Before we move on to floats, I just want to mention that their size is also 4 bytes. But if with integers the maximum value is a bit bigger than 2 billions, with floats we get 340 undecillions. If you are not familiar with the scientific notation, let me show you the decimal notation as well. If you think that this number is huge, then you're damn right. But how can we achieve this if we have the same 32 bits? Turns out they are divided into three groups. The first one is Significant or Mantissa. It is 23 bits long, well, technically 24, but one bit is implicit. The second one is called Exponent. It is 8 bits long. And the last one is one bit sign. 
And here's how we use it. It's a bit harder than with integers, but let's have a look. We already know how the sign works. Exponent is also not so hard. You see it's 8 bits, so you can treat it as one byte and to convert it to decimal you can use the same rules that I showed you a bit earlier when we were talking about chars. Then don't forget to subtract 127 as the formula suggests. The last factor is a bit harder, as you can see it starts with 1, here is the implicit bit I talked earlier, and the whole number is treated as a binary floating point number. To convert it back to decimal we need to expand our rules a bit. When you're enumerating cells, everything that goes after the floating point should get a negative index. The rest is exactly the same. If you feel like my explanation wasn't good enough for you and you need more details, I'll leave a link to a good article in the description. So, what is the important part here? The important part is that to achieve these big numbers we have to sacrifice the precision. To demonstrate that I wrote this little program. We have an integer, 9 ones. If we print it, then we get 9 ones, as expected. But if we store that in a float and then print it, then we'll get a different number. As you can see, it's bigger by 1. And if we convert it back to an integer, we are not gonna magically fix it. We lost our initial value forever. Okay, now you might be thinking, hmm, so we are always getting numbers that are bigger than our initial values. But that's not correct. If I change the last digit to 3, the number is gonna stay the same. Moreover, if I change it to 5, it still is the same. But if I change it to 6, then it changes. We get a number that is bigger by 4. And as you can see, it's quite imprecise already, and this is exactly what happens to the internal timer. The bigger the number is, the bigger imprecision becomes. That's just how flows work. They allow you to get big integers and real numbers at the cost of the precision. But anyway, can we fix this issue? As I said before, this behavior is defined by the standard. And of course we cannot really rewrite it, so nope, we can't do anything. Psych, of course we can, it's too easy as well. We just add uin32 right here, and it's done. Let me remind you what we had before. So we were trying to get a sum of an integer and a float. And since the computer doesn't really know how to do it, according to the standard, it implicitly converts the integer to the float. And then we get our issues with precision. But now we explicitly tell our program that we want this frame time variable, this float, to be converted to an integer. Which means that if, let's say, we had 33.3, .3, it becomes 33. And then we add these two integers together, we work only with integers, we don't lose anything. Everything is precise. This bug was fixed in GTA San Andreas. And I'm not going to be surprised if it was done exactly the same way. Alright, let's look at some of the effects we should expect if we play for way too long. If your save file is roughly 74.5 hours old, then I don't suggest you to do unique stun jumps. Slow motion is never going to end. Even if you get out of the vehicle, it's not going to help you. The only thing you can do is make some cool clips, but I'm sure there are mods that allow you to do the exact same thing but way easier. If you play twice as long, then you'll notice that the traffic movement becomes twitchy. And if you play four times as long, so almost 300 hours, you'll notice that it stops completely, just like the clock. But if you scare the driver, he starts to move. I also heard that with time your shooting speed changes, pickups rotating speed changes, but I'll be honest, I haven't checked that. All I know is that when the timer stops, pickups don't rotate at all, your reloading becomes infinite because every time you try to shoot, it activates the animation over and over again. I think even switching between weapons doesn't help. By the way, bullet traces don't disappear as well, they just stay there. You will not be able to use markers. I actually managed to save the game. I'm going to assume that my game lagged a bit, it allowed the timer to increase a little, and that triggered the menu. I don't suggest you to save the game though, because after that I was stuck. No matter what I tried, I couldn't move. Loading that save file back was even worse. All I saw was a black screen. If you get a blood trail, it's going to follow you everywhere, no matter how far you go. If someone gets knocked down, they won't be able to get up again, including you. If you get in a vehicle, you won't be able to fix the camera. 
even with the aiming trick I showed you earlier. If you are sensitive to a shaking camera, then skip the next 20 seconds of the video, because explosions cause it. And it also feels like that with time the shaking becomes even worse. I think you already noticed that if you lose health or armor or if you get wanted level, then elements on the hood are going to flash forever. And finally, if you have only one star wanted level, then cops become friendly, they just want to talk to you. I'm pretty sure there's a lot more. I also heard that parking lots break, as in if you take a car the next one isn't going to spawn on the same space. And that makes sense because they use internal timer for that. And this is everything I wanted to show you today, but before I go I want to mention one thing. You shouldn't think that real time is superior to in-game time. That's not true. Different games use different timing methods and that's completely fair because they both have their cons and pros. For example, some old Sony games use in-game time and some use real time. Which one to choose should depend on the game itself and sometimes even on the category. For those who love challenges I have two this time. Imagine you have a float. Which number will you get if all of the bits in significant are zeros? All of the bits in exponent and sign are ones. And the second one. I imagine you have a counter. Once again it's a float and you always increase it by one. What is the last number you can get before it stops? Once again, the first person with the correct answer gets a like on their comment. If you still have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments, I'll try to help you. The poll for the next topic is going to appear on the community tab in like 3 days from now, I'll also put the link in the pinned comment. Remember that you can always suggest your own topic and I'll put it in the poll. The only condition is it has to be related to speedrunning somehow. So you can ask, for example, how do instapasses work, or why do speedrunners blow up riders car. Thank you all for watching, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, and if you don't want to miss the next episode, consider subscribing. My name is Wafil, see you next time.